The reading this morning is from Creative Strength Training by Jane Dunawold. Maybe it's disingenuous to think each of us has the potential to be a creative genius. Talent is dispensed unequally at birth. Humans are tangled balls of social conditioning, environment, and serendipity. Life isn't fair. Luck plays a part. We've all heard someone say, I was just in the right place at the right time, or I never get lucky. A stream of this fatalistic thinking weaves in and around the subject of creativity. Most people believe you've either got it or you don't. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say rather wistfully, I'm not creative. When I hear a statement like that, I think to myself, no one has ever shown you where to begin. Because the fact is, creativity, like any skill, can be cultivated. It takes a healthy combination of focused commitment and strength training, knowledge and stamina. Think about it. Tour de France bicyclists don't know how to ride at birth. First, they learn to walk, and then they learn to pedal. Winning the Tour de France isn't spontaneous. It starts with learning to ride a bicycle. It culminates in a win preceded by years of strength training. So the winner's body and mind work in tandem to master the race. Athletes have the advantage of prescribed methods of building stamina because physical prowess is revered by our culture. Hire a personal trainer and you'll do repetitive exercises, gradually adding reps as your body gains strength. A steady, balanced program of activity is required to keep the human machine functioning at optimal level. An additional benefit is runner's high, an elevated mental state athletes report when their bodies are pushed to the brink. More than one athlete has described the experience as akin to meditation practice. In the process of training the body, the elation of discipline is discovered. It's a win-win. Musicians embrace a similar practice. Etudes are musical studies employed to master an instrument. Talking with musician friends, I realized etudes are also a form of meditation. The potential exists for the playing to center the player. As an artist, I achieve daily centering in the studio. I didn't know how to find my center in the beginning. I flailed, but gradually settled into a practice. I began to understand how to sustain creative ability by regularly creating. That's why they call it a practice. Go to the studio and make something. Go to the studio and make something. It's just another version of reps. The reflection this morning is titled Creativity, Community, and the Six Sources. In order to help the budget when we first moved into this building 25 years ago, Westside rented space to a daycare center. At first, their needs were small, but as they grew, they needed more and more of our space and had more and more stuff that had to be moved and then put back every weekend. Privacy and safety concerns for the children meant that we had no access to our own building during the week until 6.30. By this time three years ago, we looked like a daycare allowing space for a church instead of uh, the other way around. So we in the congregation gathered up our courage and our faith in the future and voted to tell the daycare that we would not renew their lease, which expired about two years ago. 
With the whole building ours at last, you will remember that Diane Nixon, the Building and Grounds Committee, and many more willing hands did an incredible job of transforming Westside from daycare site to spacious and welcoming church. It was magical. When I was almost finished, Diane asked me to make a quilted wall hanging nine feet long and six feet wide for the foyer. Sure, I said. Be glad to, I said. And then I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into this time? There were three factors to consider. The first was the theme. What did I want the quilt to be about? Then I had to decide on a design. How could I express the theme? What should it look like? The third one was technical. How I could put together something so big. The technical elements were a challenge from the beginning because of its size. Art quilts are usually about the same size as paintings. Uh, but for one thing, it was crucial that the completed quilt hang flat and straight on the wall from top to bottom. Every decision had to be made with this in mind so it would not end up curling. Also, I had to design it in my head. Quilt artists usually work from design walls. It's like having a painting resting on an easel. We put our pieces of fabric up on the wall so we can stand back and see from a distance how the colors and shapes are working together. We stare at it for a while and then go away and let it marinate. Then we come back and perhaps try different colors, shapes, or patterns to see if something else works better. We play, we experiment. Because of its size, I had to hold the design entirely in my head and hope that what I imagined would actually be there in the fabric after it was done. I wanted the theme to be meaningful, to express some of what keeps me coming back to Westside. After mulling it over, I decided on the six sources of the UU faith. Our former minister, Reverend Alex Holt, once observed that we tend not to talk about the sources nearly as much as we do the principles. So I thought perhaps having a representation of them would be a good reminder. And for me, as I got into them and thought about them, as they began to take shape in my mind, I became convinced that they deserve special attention. For someone who wants to understand Unitarian Universalism, and what it means, learning about the sources is definitely worthwhile. A quilt is a picture, not a printed page. So the last step was deciding how did he pick the sources in some sort of meaningful way. After a great deal of dithering and much consultation with Google Images, I came up with elements, simple representations that I thought would illustrate them. I didn't try to develop one for each source, but let the ideas overlap and shift. My hope was that these elements would suggest the sources in different ways to different viewers. After all, it is the UU way for each of us to find our own path. Reverend Kathleen Rowlands said, throughout history, we have moved to the rhythms of mystery and wonder prophecy, wisdom, teachings from ancient and modern sources, and nature herself. We call these concepts the six sources. I have taken some of my material from pamphlets available from the UUA. The first source refers to a transcending sense of wonder found in all religions. I decided that the large tree would represent nature in all her beauty which often inspires such feelings. The everlasting renewal of life in its amazing variety of forms strikes us with awe. So does the night sky portrayed in the quilt's background. In a TED talk from our recent Wisdom Covenant packet, Anne Lamott was talking about what she had learned that was true. One truth she offered was simply, go outside, look up. 
Secondly, the sources list the inspiring words and deeds of prophetic people. The sources were originally written in 1984 and last amended in 2018 when the words prophetic women and men were changed to prophetic people. I didn't have this update on my copy, so unfortunately my label still says women and men. I apologize for this oversight. Inspiring words and deeds was a bit of a stumper. How do you make a picture of a great deed? I finally decided on a book where profound words of wisdom from many sources may be recorded. I quote from the UUA pamphlet, Six Sources and Sacred Texts. Unitarian Universalist individuals make chosen texts sacred when they use them as guidance and inspiration for living. Congregations make particular texts sacred when they turn to them again and again for spiritual and ethical insight. Sacred texts can include the writings of spiritual teachers and poets, prayers of the 12-step tradition, and stories of the unfolding wonders of our natural world. Sacred to many Unitarian Universalists are the letters and speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the poetry of Rumi and Gibran, the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, and writings of Nikki Giovanni and Maya Angelou, and many others. The third source is the wisdom of the world's great religions. UUs come from many backgrounds, and we each bring new ideas and beliefs with us. The Christian scriptures, the Torah, the Quran, and the Tao Te Ching can all be meaningful to Unitarian Universalists. Many of us find the teachings of the Buddha to be inspiring. I made a wheel shape on the quilt to refer to the Buddhist wheel of life. It could also represent meditation while walking a circular path. I asked the kids in the CRE program if they would make handprints for me going around the wheel because I wanted to include them as a vital part of our journey here at Westside. Jewish and Christian teachings call us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I added a Star of David and then looked for Christian images. I could have used a cross, but I have some trouble with that image. To me, it represents both love and cruelty. I was really pleased when I came across three overlapping circles representing the Trinity. I had never seen this before, but the more I looked at it, at this symbol, the more I saw a lovely representation of inclusion and diversity. Jesus taught that we should love everyone, and we agree wholeheartedly. We've also learned from humanist teachings, which remind us of the value of science and reason. From the UUA pamphlet, Faith in UU Humanists, we are encouraged to think for ourselves and use our own minds and the things we have learned as best we can. Our Unitarian Universalist tradition is intertwined with humanist thought. We believe in the importance of the lives we live. We wonder and rejoice in the natural world. We welcome the discoveries of science and human reason. And we believe that it is human beings who have the capacity to dismantle injustice and care for one another. The humanist symbol looks to me like a person, either reaching upward or dancing, or maybe both. Finally, we learn from the spiritual teachings of earth-based religions, which remind us that we are both a part of nature and its caretaker. Sweet home teacup. Yes, sweet home teacup says in a prayer quoted in the UUA website, being human means we are of this earth. We are these waters. We are fire and atmosphere. We are the sun and the moon and the stars. 
We are all that we see, and the wisdom is revealed by looking in between. The quilt tree has not only leaves, but roots curling into the earth. I couldn't make you you art without including a chalice, symbol of our faith. I deliberately placed the flame off center within its circling frame. One universalist symbol before Unitarians and Universalists merged was an off center cross within a circle. The extra space indicated that there is always room and everyone is welcome. Designing and constructing this quilt was a labor of love for me in every respect. I am thrilled that I got the opportunity to do it. One of the things that happens sometimes when folks see something I've made is they give me a lovely compliment, which of course I just eat up. But then they go on to say, oh, I could never do that. I'm not creative. And I want to contradict them very flatly and say, everybody's creative. That would not be polite. It's true. It's just not polite to contradict people. Anyone can make something. All it takes is confidence and practice. I have been so lucky all along that I've had so much support while I was trying my art wings. I've been able to find friends who say, yes, you can. And, oh, that's interesting. And what if you tried this? We UUs come together in community as we do the difficult work of learning our own truth and following our own spiritual path. Many of us feel that we would not be able to do this or do this nearly as well alone. We recognize the importance of our community. In fact, we call it beloved. For many of us, it is of paramount importance. The same kind of supportive community has helped me in my attempts to make art. I've made friends with other quilt artists, and when we get together, we pass around all kinds of suggestions about the design, the color, and the techniques we use. We bounce ideas off each other and work together to find new ways to design. Now, I don't know how much this kind of supportive group would be of value to a true introvert. I have no personal insight into what it would be like to be other than an off the charts extrovert. But I can't help feeling that finding at least one kindred spirit could add a whole other dimension to any creative work. When I was making the foyer quilt, two of my friends were my cheerleaders. That's how I thought of them. They didn't actually see much of it until it was almost finished, but they let me talk about it and encouraged me to feel that I was headed in the right direction. It made a world of difference. Recently, I talked to a friend of mine who has been making quilts for about 20 years. Her name is Jen Haxton, and I have permission to quote her. She has a master's in industrial engineering and management and works as a technical analyst. Her background doesn't make me think of her as an artist, but her quilts do. When I told her that I wanted to use her work as an illustration of the fact that everyone can be creative, she insisted that creativity is more than making. It is problem solving. She offered as an example the time she figured out how to make a well-lit makeup mirror in a poorly equipped motel room. That was being creative. Her words, could not have been more timely. The coronavirus has turned our lives upside down lately, including my reflection today. I was going to talk about how everyone can learn to make some kind of art and how that is good for us. It's good for our brains and our outlook on life. It can be an outlet for celebrating great occasions, 
and for mourning calamities and losses. Instead, I've been thinking about how we all have to be creative in another way, in solving a host of brand new day-to-day -day problems and coping with novel situations, and how important it is to do that together. I belong to a covenant group, and we recently discussed the topic for March, wisdom. It seemed to me that what they meant by wisdom was mostly advice, what others have told us, for better or for worse. Wasn't sure I agreed with that. But now we're in a unique situation, at least I hope it's unique, where we all actually need each other's wisdom and advice. I find myself pondering big questions like, what is the world going to be like when this is over? And medium ones. How are the mothers of small children refraining from just tying them to something big and heavy for a while? And, and really small ones like, why am I, after a lifetime of couldn't care less, suddenly making my bed every morning? But the really important one is, how do we recreate our community, our beloved community here at Westside and all of our other communities? We are going to need all the wisdom that we can find. When I look at the sources of UU belief now, I see more than an outline for a specific religion. I see an outline for how we can recover. I invite you to look at them too. What can you find there that will serve as you make a new community?